Good morning everybody and welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. I'm sorry that for, for the first time I think I'm going to have to start with a series of apologies. <laughs> uh, one is I'm sorry that we're only broadcasting on the Highland Archive Centre page uh, today and not on uh, all the pages as we usually do. Uh, and the second is that I'm very conscious that my screen is in reverse. Um, and both of those are due to a technical uh, fault on our work computers, which means that I can't broadcast on my work laptop, so I'm instead on my home tablet. Um, so really the, the issue is that I'm sorry my jumper says oh, 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 rather than ho, ho, ho. So, but thank you, Carolyn, for liking it anyway. Um, thank you for all the hellos that are already coming in. It's always lovely to see. Uh, and as I say, welcome to this uh, episode of Learn with Lorna. As normal, this is brought to you at no cost by High Life Highland. Uh, High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in, in the Learn with Lorna series. But if you are in a position to... <laughs> thank you for saying my uh, back to front jumper is great. Um, if you're in a position to be able to donate towards the work of the Highland Archive Service, then we would very much appreciate that. And there's a link to be able to do so within the text uh, of this post. Thank you so much to those of you who have done that. It's uh, so much appreciated. It truly is. Uh, as always, thank you, as I say, for your donations. Thank you for your comments. Uh, thank you for all your support and for the, the lovely emails and messages and uh, Christmas cards and things that I've had from people. It's truly appreciated. Um, as I have said, and you, if you've watched before, you, you will know the Highland Archive Service has four offices. We have one in Wick in Caithness, one in Fort William in Loch Aber, and one in Portree in the Isle of Skye that covers Skye and Loch Alsh, and one in Inverness. Um, over these this series of talks, I've, I've tried to look at collections that cover all of them, uh, that are... Um, Kind of a, have a joined up theme across all the offices, but also uh, collections that are unique to each individual office. And so this week I wanted to look at one uh, from the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness. And this is the last of the um, kind of specific collection themed ones that I'm going to do this year. But I really, really hope you're able to join me next week when I'll be looking at Christmas records from within all four archives, any references to Christmas, and then the following week uh, so that'll be Christmas Eve, and then the following week, Hogmanay, I'll be looking at traditions and festivities within the collections. Um, so I really hope you can join me uh, next time with, you know, a glass of something and a mince pie. But this week I wanted to look at Alexander Fraser Timber Merchants Collection. Now I've spoken before uh, about business collections and the way they often contain fantastic information about not only the, the operation of that specific business, um, for instance, the Duncan McPherson collection in Sky that we looked at, they also can have a, a great deal of information about the impact of a business on an area, such as when we did AI Welders or the Rose Street Foundry. Um, and often they contain a lot of information about the family who owns or runs the business. And Alexander Fraser Timber Merchant is a great example of this. It contains a huge amount of social history, um, a huge amount of information about the family who own the business, about general life in the Highlands and all sorts of other things. There are, uh, there's correspondence, there are ledgers, there are uh, all sorts of pamphlets and information from all sorts of um, different organisations and different things that the family were involved in. So that's a, a kind of overview of the collection. But before I do that, I wanted to um, say just a little bit about what business records are, why they're kept in the first place and how they end up in a collection like ours. Um, I've covered some of this on previous episodes but I know that because we've now gone on for so many weeks there's people who have joined who haven't always seen all the earlier ones so I just wanted to touch on some of this again. Business records are often kept for, for different reasons. They're kept for evidence. They are kept to provide evidence of products, of services, of the administration of a business, of the management, of the staffing, things like that. So they prove evidence. They're often kept for legal compliance. So quite often businesses will keep records for taxation purposes, for employment law purposes, um, because they want to copyright something like patents or intellectual property. So that's the reasons that they're kind of kept on a, um, a daily uh, 
basis, if you know what I mean. That's why they're, they, they're kept as an active collection of records. But then what happens to them after uh, the business ceases to trade or indeed while the business is still um, uh, trading? The records become an asset uh, of the company. So the company owns the records and they are able to dispose of them however they want to. Obviously they need to keep them for certain uh, legal cl compliance purposes. But after that, they can either decide to keep them. So for instance, many large companies have their own archives, the likes of um, big banks and institutions like that, Boots, Unilever, those kind of big organisations have their own uh, organisational archive. Others might choose to deposit them with often with a university archive. So for instance, Marks and Spencers uh, are with Leeds, BPs are in Warwick, things like that. But smaller businesses and local businesses often put their collections into local archives like ours. And we have loads of them across the Highland Archive Service. In all four of our offices, we have uh, solicitors collections, uh, auction marts, general stores, manufacturers, um, all sorts of different and diverse businesses. And they really, really add to the types of records that we hold because of the social history that they contain. Uh, Jenny, I'm seeing your message that next week might be a challenge in Australia, but it will be because it will be at 9pm, but you can do it if you've got wine and mince pies. So uh, I hope you're all going to follow Jenny's lead there. Um, so what's in Alexander Fraser Timber Merchants Collection? Why is it uh, important? Well, the collection dates from 1775 through to 1854. So an, an interesting period in, in uh, world history and, and in British history, and it contains a real mixture of things. The company was started uh, in the mid 1700s by uh, Alexander Fraser. It was a timber company, but also it was a general merchants company. And it was based in Inverness, in uh, Castle Street originally, but it did move, but we'll, we'll come on to that in a, in a second. Um, the timber business was was very substantial. I think sometimes, you know, there's there's conflicting thoughts in our heads sometimes, I think, about the Highlands being quite remote and rural on one hand, but on the other hand, this is a time of huge connectivity and uh, people travelling the world and, you know, with the East India Company and all sorts of other organisations, people are moving about the world a lot. And you can absolutely see this within this collection. There are correspondence, there's correspondence and receipts that show the extent to which this, you know, as a relatively small company based in, in Inverness at the time, were trading with everybody, customers and stockists, from Lerwick and Kirkwall down to London and Newcastle. They were trading with Rotterdam. They were trading with all sorts of different people. And there are hundreds of letters and correspondence files dealing with this. There are bundles and bundles of hundreds of documents that talk about this. And I think that it gives a really good insight into how much this company, although based in one place in the Highlands, had an a, a outreach to, to such a wide uh, audience. It contains, the collection contains evidence of, it's definitely not too happy to wish me, a, uh, too early to wish me a happy Christmas, thank you. Uh, same to you, but we'll come back to that next week. Um, it contains evidence of the people who worked in the organisation. So you can see uh, people being paid in wages, to their, their wages to transport timber, to fell timber, to move it from the major estates around Inverness and get it out to um, whoever was purchasing it. And the image that I used to advertise this event, if you were able to have a close look at it, you'll have seen that it was an, an order for timber for the Caledonian Canal and it was signed in 1804 by Thomas Telford. So you can see that uh, this organisation, this business in Inverness is, is involved in some huge construction projects. And actually it's for wood of, um, let me just get my facts right here, 46 feet long and 12 to 14 inches square. And they say that it's for 24,000 cubic feet in pieces over 30 foot long. So substantial pieces of wood and a substantial business. Also within these bundles of the business records, um, if anyone was watching Gentleman Jack, the series that went out uh, on the BBC last year about the, the story of Anne Lister and her diaries, if anyone uh, watched that, they'll be familiar with the Rawson brothers who were uh, mentioned. Um, 
and there are letters to and from the Rawsons in this collection in Halifax. So um, they were also obviously trading with, with people in Yorkshire for timber as well. The business grew and grew um, and gradually the... <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because I'm seeing uh, my colleague Jamie saying, on behalf of Lorna, I don't think it's too early to wish Happy Christmas, so thank you. Um, yeah, the business increased and uh, as it did so, the Frasers had ships built in, to, for the sole purpose of expanding their business, further supplying uh, goods and timber. And I'm seeing your question there about, um, you know, where did all the timber come from? I think... There are certainly references talking about real estate, talking about other estates round about Inverness who uh, would allow timber to be felled on them. I think we have, someone may be able to correct me on this, but I think there's been a very um, kind of changeable history with the Highlands with timber. There have been periods when it's been very highly wooded, forested, and periods where it hasn't been. So as I say, there are letters uh, in this collection that detail payment to workers for labour and they list, list names of workers and the payments due to them, two and six uh, a day for felling timber. And I wanted to read to you one uh, document that talks about the some workers who had written to the company asking uh, for a pay rise in 1831. So forgive me, I'm going to read this off my phone <laughs> um, as I can't get onto my normal computer screen. So this is a letter from 1831. Sir, William Fraser, John Bain, Angus Mackay, Hugh Ross and Hugh Chisholm, present carters in your woods. We find that we cannot continue to work any more for you for the price that you are giving us at present. The lowest price that we can take is sixpence for the common props per dozen, crown props per dozen sevenpence, fisher row props per hundred uh, linear feet sixpence, and square wood per foot solid one penny. We are very willing to serve you in as far as our power, but less than the above prices mentioned, we cannot do it. Your Eastwood has cut up all our horses and we will not work passing this day until we have your answer to this, which we hope you will give us on Monday, but we will remain ever faithful to your work. Just an, an interesting example of the time where people are starting to say, I want to work, but I want to improve my conditions or I want to improve uh, the wages, things like that. And just really interesting to look through if you're local to the Highlands, and I'm, I'm well aware that there are people watching from both Highland and out with, but there are lists of names in there. And that's just worth a look for interest, and particularly if you have family from round and about this area. So that's a little bit about the timber side of the business. The business also, as I mentioned, had a general merchant's. And that dealt in a really wide range of commodities. There are letters that detail the sales of things as diverse as whiskey and green tea uh, to meal and clover seeds. There are price lists in this collection that show um, that some of the stock was bought in from London and other places. There are ledgers that show where some of the stock was going to. So for instance, there's a huge list in one of the ledgers that details stock going to the schooner Macduff of Inverness and they're supplying tea and coffee, molasses, raw sugar, um, barley, split peas, salt. So you can see there some of the types of things that would be used on board ship for, um, for preserving food. So things like uh, salt that would need to be taken. Uh, Nancy, I'm seeing you asked, did they win their increase in their wages? That I don't know. Um, it's Christmas, let's hope they did. In uh, 1817, Alexander Fraser, the business moved from uh, Castle Street to East Street in Inverness and an inventory of the stock was taken. And this is ideal for us because it means we've got a kind of a snapshot of the things that were uh, in, the, in the shop at the time. And we can see that they also had household items. So there are things like chamber pots, plates, ladles. And like I say, it's absolutely to our benefit that they moved at that point and made a list of everything. But I wanted to read you just a little bit of this inventory because see if you have the same thought that I do about walking into this shop. Raisins and figs, honey and magnesia, senna leaves, roshan, bath bricks, Carolina rice, East India rice, casks of vinegar, snuff, sealing wax, pepper, nutmeg, cloves, cinnamon, ginger, chamomile. And every time I look at that, I think that shop must have felt 
smelt phenomenal. You imagine walking in there and all of those things uh, in jars on the shelves and how beautiful it would have smelt. In uh, 1818, so the year after the business moved premises, Alexander Fraser died and his son John took over. He formalised the business, uh, put it on a much more formal footing, and it was him who established the name uh, Alexander Fraser and Company. John carried on with uh, the timber business and the general merchants, but he also had the, the ability of his father to diversify and, and change the way the company operated. And he increased the company's trade in wool, and he went on to become the Inverness agent for the Perth Banking Company, and also he served a term as the provost of Inverness from 1834 to 1836. Uh, I'm not sure how widespread the word provost is, so for those of you who don't know it, it's uh, similar to a mayor uh, of the town. John's time as a bank agent uh, for the Perth Banking Company also provides a wealth of correspondence because as he's acting for an agent on behalf of other people as a kind of go-between between between them and the bank, there are, there's correspondence in there between people who for whom he's acted as an agent. So again, lists of names and ideas of the sort of things that were happening in the town and the wider area, the sort of money people were getting paid for things. It just gives you a really good insight into living conditions, social history and, and the standards of living. Before I go uh, any further, to remind you, as you will be familiar with now, that uh, this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. But we uh, would willingly and gratefully accept donations and thank you to those of you who have done that. Um, in addition to the business papers, there are family papers to be found within this collection. And I know I've mentioned on previous weeks that that's quite common within a business collection that you'll find personal papers. So there is uh, correspondence, there are diaries, and they show all sorts of items that show the personal lives of the people involved and also what their interests are and the wider things, wider causes and things that they're involved in. Now, Alexander Fraser, who you remember was John's father, in addition to managing the business, he had also been a schoolmaster at Raining School, which was one of the earliest, uh, one of the early schools in Inverness. And so there are some items relating to his time as a schoolmaster. Both the father and the son were heavily involved uh, in church affairs, and there are a lot of papers that relate to this as well. John was the secretary of, you'll love this, this is an, an excellent name for an organisation, I hate having to read it out. John... Uh, was the secretary of the Association for Educating Poor Pious Young Men Intended for the Ministry. And I just desperately wish they had got a shorter name for that organisation. He was a, a devout Presbyterian, later uh, joined the Free Church. And so there are documents within this collection that talk about the impact of the church on the local area. There are lists of paupers in Inverness and the allowances that were given to them. There are lists of people to whom Bibles were distributed within Inverness. They were also uh, involved in a lot of international campaigns and again I think that kind of spreads our image of Inverness being kind of a settled place within the Highlands, which of course it is, um, but also having this wider connection with the world. So for instance there are documents that relate uh, to campaigns, societies and causes from uh, all different places across the world. There are references to the Scottish Ladies' Society for the promoting of education of females in Greece. Interesting, I think, that, that they had a, an involvement in that. There are also documents relating to the abolition of slavery campaign. I wanted to pull out a couple of documents, particularly from these family papers, to talk about. One is a letter from a, a cousin of the family in 1801. And the the reason I wanted to pull it out is because it's a letter written um, from, let me just get the uh, the details up, it's written uh, from Demerara. So although the family later went on to become involved in the abolition of slavery movement, it's interesting that at some point some members of the family had been in the Caribbean and there to make money and, and certainly owned slaves. This letter, I just wanted to read a little extract from it. It talks about um, going to the Caribbean, making money, the 
impact on slaves, the it talks about the number of his acquaintances that have died, and I, I maybe mentioned this during um, Slavery Week when I spoke about that. He talks about the hard industries in this colony and how hard life is, and he describes his, his father as being a man who loved his bottle more than his work, and then describes the, his heartache at losing a family member. But this was the extract I wanted to, to read to you. Um, there is only two of the fifteen who came out with us, still in life. Mr Donald McBain, who came out alone days ago, is dead. Mr Donald McIntosh of Duncroy and Mr Lachlan McKimmon, his year ha this year has been fatal to many and more than 800 of my acquaintances have died. Yesterday a Mr Hugh Rose, son to the Reverend Rose of Tain, was shot in a duel. You're surprised that my uncle has made no money and been so long here in search of it. But I've seen him, I saw him last week and he is now quite sickly in this colony. And they talked about, say, he talked about saying how hard a life it is in uh, Demerera and how he can't wait to, to come home. Now, I kind of put a codicil on that as I did during Slavery Week to say yes, that those, the lives of some of the people who went out from the Highlands to the, to the West Indies was very difficult but of course pales in comparison to how difficult it would have been for the slaves working on the plantation. But I find that interesting that that document is in there because I wonder how those cousins felt about it at that stage or did their disagreement with the slave industry come about after that or during that? Was it connected? Uh, probably we'll never know. Um, but it's, I find it very interesting, as you'll know from listening to me witter on for weeks, the the relationships between those sorts of things, how do those things come about? What what prompts uh, something to happen within a family and those things all happening concurrently? Um, the formation, the, the Society for the Affecting the Abolition of Slavery had been formed in 1787 and in 1807 was the abolition of the slave trade and it was 1833 that the Slavery Abolition Act actually came in. Um, and that letter that I was just looking at there dates from 1801. So it's sort of right in the middle of the the momentum is up in trying to uh, abolish slavery, but we haven't got to a point of legislation yet. Um, so it's just interesting to see how they would have had a foot in the camp of a family member being there, but also a foot in the camp of um, being so heavily involved in in the church and in equality and in uh, education that, that it would have um, sat uncomfortably with them. I wanted to read you another absolutely fantastic letter from this collection. This one dates from 1817 and it describes a holiday that John Fraser took in Italy. So if you bear with me now I'm going to look this way to the, all the props I have set up because of, I'm not able to do this normally today. Okay so it's written from Rome in 1817 and it reads, My dear sister, who would have guessed that I would ever be able to address a letter to you from this noble city? And he goes on to describe going to uh, travelling around Italy, but through all of my travels I was impelled by a strong desire to see this queen of cities and some of the wonders and beauties with which she is so richly furnished. And I have as yet every cause to be pleased with my choice. And he describes his journey through uh, Florence. He says that the country seemed even more beautiful than when I passed through it before. And when he gets to Florence, he says, I saw many churches. I traversed the whole town on both sides of the River Arno and had much pleasure in examining the paintings, the statues and the famous doors of the baptistry which were within my reach. I saw high mass performed at the great chancel by the Archbishop of Florence. I went to the Pitti Palace, but there was no entrance there on that day. Describes the, the scenery of Tuscany, uh, travelling through past towns and hill forts, and then he says, in the afternoon, from the top of a little hill, I had a fine view of Rome at a distance. I never felt the same way approaching any city. At ten o'clock, when I was going out to see the antiquities, we saw a great procession moving with the utmost ecclesiastical and military pomp. It was St Charles's Day, and the Pope with his cardinals was going to celebrate High Mass in the Saint's Church. We followed and got an excellent seat in the front where we saw everything. The Pope was a poor-looking old man, richly dressed and borne through the church on a magnificent state chair on shoulders. The cardinals all kissed his hands. And then he just describes 
all the people that he's seen traveling, seeing the Colosseum, seeing uh, the Trajan's Column, and all of these different places, including the catacombs. So he talks about sh seeing chandeliers of human bones. I don't know if any of you have seen those. I've been there in, in Rome to see those catacombs, and it's, it is a very unnerving uh, sight, and he says it's, it's quite a quite a horrid sight to see. But he says, the ruins are my favourite of everything. They're not as perfect as I had hoped, but they're noble, and they've inspired me with much of the enthusiasm I felt when I was every day reading about the Roman heroes. I must, however, confess that I am more affected and elevated with beholding grand and awful appearances of nature than anything art can produce, and if ever I see Vesuvius it will be with very different feelings. So there's this absolutely beautiful way of writing. Talking about these experiences, we get a view of what somewhere of great antiquity like uh, Italy looked like to someone who had come from Inverness. And there's this, this feeling of huge experience and gratitude and, and what it felt like to experience that. But I think my favourite line in this letter is the last line. It says, however, I wish I could peep over your shoulder and see how everyone is in Church Street, because I am with the greatest esteem and affect, as well as with the fondest love and attachment, your affectionate friend and brother. And that just ties you back to that feeling of family and what are you, what are you all doing at home? Because although I'm having this amazing experience, uh, I'm still thinking of you. So the business records for Alexander Fraser Timber Merchants end in uh, 1836 and the following year John Fraser emigrated to Canada. We don't know if he passed the business on to anyone but as I say from our point of view those business records have quite an abrupt end in 1836. He died uh, only a few years later in Canada after an accident. Um, I hope that that's given you some idea of what's in this collection. It is such a varied and interesting collection and really anyone who has an, an interest in the social history and development of the Highlands I would really encourage you, when, when you're able to, to, to come and have a look at this collection because it really is just full of everything from the price of cloves in 1831 to the education of young ladies in Greece. Um, it's a really fascinating collection uh, and yeah, covers up an interesting time period. Um, I hope you can join me next week. As I say, next week I'll be looking at uh, Christmas records and Christmas references including there is somebody in one of our valuation roles, property records, who is called Mr Christmas Sparks, which is, I think to date, my favourite name that I've found uh, in a valuation role. Christmas William Sparks. Um, so I hope you can join me next week when we look at that. Again, thank you so much for your lovely comments and um, a reminder that this series uh, is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. But if you are able uh, to donate towards the work of the service, we would really appreciate that. Uh, Angela, thank you. Who knew timber could be so fascinating? I know, right? Because they talk about timber and they talk about everything else under the sun. It's marvellous. Thank you for all your comments and uh, we'll speak to you next week. I hope you can uh, join me and I'm aware that it's a big ask on Christmas Eve, but... I'll be there, so you must also be there. Thank you.